late. I'm already live, Anthony, so it doesn't matter if you're not ready. We're live. So, hello everyone. We are pulling up the stuff once we go live here. We need to get everything queued up so that we can uh, we can make sure everything is running smoothly. This is Answering Islam Live. We are going to be taking questions. Oh, I see my wife over here in the chat. And that would be a good person to make a moderator. But I can't do it from the program here. I have to get into, uh, have to get onto the actual page. So this is Answering Islam Live, where we answer questions having to do with Christianity and Islam. And we do it live. So um, tonight we are going, well, today or this morning or whatever time it is for you, we're going to look at a couple questions that we were going to get to a couple of these yesterday. Um, some of them are, are pretty quick, but we were having technical difficulties yesterday. Hopefully those are mostly gone today. But we're going to be answering a couple of quick questions. Then we're going to look at a comment by Kufar Watch. Um, for those of you who are there yesterday, Kufar Watch kept complaining that people weren't able to answer his questions. So we aim to please. So we're going to take a closer look at his question. He post, he actually posted a comment on yesterday's video, not in the chat, but an actual comment where he sort of went through his full argument. So we're going to take a look at his, his full, full argument. We're going to go through it step by step and see if he has a good point or if he is somehow undermining Christian theology. All right, adding my wife as a moderator here. Renee is already a moderator. So we have a couple of moderators there. And just so moderators know, the, the basic idea is um, we understand that people are going to come from different parts of the internet. And we understand that uh, people can be very aggressive, but you know there, ha there has to be limits here. If people are just here calling each other names, insulting each other, uh, they have to go, especially if it's you know very offensive terms, like if someone were to follow Muhammad's example, come on here and start calling uh, Africans raisin heads the way Muhammad did, that person's got to go. Can't be calling people raisin heads like Muhammad did. Um, so we want to keep our eyes open for that sort of thing. And with that said, uh, Anthony, any introductory thoughts? Uh, no, I'm looking forward to addressing the Kufar King. <laughs> for, for those of you who don't know, the... <laughs> The Kafir King is Robert Spencer, so Kufar Watch, we're making him the Kufar King. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and look at a couple very quickly here. Um, Robert is uh, one of my patrons on Patreon. Robert says, uh, Hi, David. I spoke at a debate last year in my home city, Melbourne, Australia, on the topic, What is the Nature of God? Trinity or Tawheed. I'm interested in doing more debates uh, in the future with Muslims and perhaps atheists as well. What advice do you have for the apologist of the next generation? What training and preparation have you found helpful for your debates? So, Anthony, you want to go ahead and share any insights that you have about debate that you've learned. And by the way, how many, uh, talk about a little bit about your debates, your debate background, and then any insights you've had. Yeah, I'm not sure how many debates I've done. Uh, you know, I don't usually sit around counting them up, uh, but I, I think it was, it's around a, a dozen, and some of them appear on the Act 17 Apologetics YouTube page uh, that we're currently uh, hosting live right now. Uh, I think on there I have a debate from many years ago with Osama Abdullah on whether or not Muhammad was a prophet. Uh, I have a debate, I think it's on there, with Ijaz Ahmed on whether or not the Old Testament teaches the distinct divine identity of the angel of the Lord, so it's essentially a Trinitarian topic. Uh, and then I think the last debate I did was I did two debates with a writer for Taqwa magazine. Taqwa is the Arabic word for piety. And an author for that magazine wanted to uh, make his way into the uh, arena of apologetics. And I think he's, he's done doing apologetics now. Uh, he did two debates with me, and uh, 
Uh, the first debate was, was Muhammad a prophet? The other debate was, uh, uh, does the New Testament teach that Jesus is God? At least one of those is on Acts 17 apologetics. Uh, now, as far as, far as uh, de- uh, pr- preparation for debate, my own approach has been uh, to look at every single argument that I can find that a Muslim will make against the Christian topic that's being debated and every single argument that Muslims uh, would make in favor of their own topic and then provide, or at least just for myself, I would write a one-page response to each one of those arguments. I don't necessarily take those with me into the debate. Just the the act of going through uh, the argument and responding to it initially on my own time, uh, uh, my intention is to become familiar with the argument pro and con and then be able to respond to it. Uh, Now, I would say that the last debate that I did with Andrew Livingston, I looked at every argument Muslims make in favor of Muhammad's prophethood, and he didn't bring a single one of those arguments. So uh, I'm not telling you that you can be sure uh, that this is going to already prepare you to answer that particular argument, but uh, I do still think that it's wise. Um, The other thing... Uh, that I do is I look at everything that my opponent has written on the relevant topics and uh, see if there's any material that I think is particularly useful. Now, in the debate with uh, uh, Andrew Livingston, uh, I did find things that were relevant. In fact, uh, we're going to talk in a a bit about the Quran. Uh, One of the comments he made in our debate on uh, whether or not Muhammad was a prophet, uh, we were arguing whether Muhammad was a prophet in light of Muhammad's inconsistent teachings regarding divinity. I argued that Muhammad actually commits the cardinal Islamic sin of shirk by saying that Allah and the Quran are both eternal, so you have two eternals, which is, by definition, shirk, according to the Quran. Uh, on a, in a comment that he made on at one point, he said that the uh, a Muslim asked him if the Quran performed a particular miracle. Some Muslims believe that if you read the Quran, it, it will cause something miraculous to happen. And Andrew's response was, no, the Quran didn't do that. Only Allah can perform a miracle. And so he made a clear distinction between Allah and the Quran. Allah can perform miracles the Quran can't. However, both Allah and the Quran are eternal. And so I I just use that to reinforce the point that Allah and the Quran are two distinct things. And so, so he can't then argue later that Allah and his word are one. Uh, at least they're not absolutely one in the sense that Muslims insist uh, has to be true in order to avoid shirk. So uh, those are some of my uh, uh, ideas when it comes to preparing for a debate. I know that David, uh, he'll, ha- he'll give you some of his own comments, but I know that David has been around debating some of these topics for so long that uh, I imagine that some of his debates he just walks into and says, uh, let's do it. Uh, actually, that uh, that brings that brings me up to a problem. I actually have a problem with preparation, namely that if I'm not, if I don't find a debater particularly intimidating, it's not that I consciously don't prepare. I just can't get kind of motivated to prepare. Right when uh, what's sad what's sad about that is if it's opponent who if it's an opponent whose arguments I I don't take seriously and an opponent I think is is not going to be a good debater and I don't prepare much, then even if I go in there and I make my points in the debate and people are convinced that I won the debate, it could have been a massacre. You know what I mean? It could have been, it could, it could have just been, it could have been more one-sided. Um, so preparation is key. Um, a good work ethic, certainly, I mean, think about this. If I had a good work ethic when it came to debate, um, I could be, do, I, I, I could be doing much more. So if you have a, a, a good work ethic, that will carry you a long way because some of your opponents won't. And so if you're actually walking into the debate prepared, you've prepared to defend your own points and prepared to respond to your opponent's points, um, that'll work very well. Um, apart from that, one um, one point as far as if you're debating Muslims and, and lots of atheists as well, uh, it, it's just, and I don't know, you, you mentioned that you're, you're, you're from down under there. Um, I don't know how things are down there, but here in the United States, a lot, uh, many Christians are are convinced that the person who is nicest in the debate wins the debate, right? Like, that's your main goal. Your main goal is to show that you are the nicest person in the debate. Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying be a jerk, 
Um, but there are many Christians who think that's the main criterion. And the problem is Muslims do not have that as any criterion at all. M most Muslims um, do not have that as any sort of criterion. So you can go in there. And I've seen this over and over again, where Christians walk out of there saying, ah, oh, look how wonderful our debater did. He showed how nice he was. And the Muslims walk out going, wow, the Christian debater got slaughtered. And the reason is they're not focused on that sort of thing. So Muslims are much more focused on sort of who comes across as most powerful in the debates, like, like who has a more commanding presence. And sadly, that's the main thing that many Muslims are looking for, even, even ahead of arg actual arguments. They're looking for who is the most powerful person on stage. So keep in mind, this isn't a, this isn't a kind of physical power. It's just who, who seems more, more dominant. And so the, the, the point here is when you're debating and preparing for how you're going to present information, you got to think of who this is geared towards, um, because if it's geared towards towards Western Christians, many of them are focused on on who's who's nicer, who's coming across as the nicer person in the debate. If you're, you're trying to reach Muslims, um, you're going to want to pay attention. And again, because people don't understand this, this isn't this isn't uh, about being mean or being being a jerk. You can be, uh, you can have a smile on your face, um, be interacting humorously with the material, and yet um, have a, a dominant presence in the debate. So uh, things like that are important to, to keep in mind just because with Muslims more than with other groups, they pay a lot of it, they're, 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 they're paying more attention to how you're presenting your information um, than, than what you're presenting. So you want to have the best arguments and you want to present them in a way that's going to reach the Muslims there. So hope that helps, and we have a couple of short ones before we want to get to our good friend Kufar Watch. So a uh, couple of short ones here. Actually, I think this one's directed for me. Yeah, uh, Fatima, if you remember her, this is from a couple days ago, and Fatima co commented, Wood spends more time speaking about Islam than his own faith. I have never seen a Muslim do the same. Muslims are focused on their own faith since it's the truth. Wood's hobby is Islam. He might as well become a Muslim. Now, there are so many silly points there, but they're, uh, it's, it's easy to, to address. Um, so she's never seen a Muslim who spends a whole lot of time talking about Christianity. I have no idea which internet she's on, but there are, there are entire Muslim channels that are just dedicated to attacking Christian apologists in particular. There are entire channels out there that are filled with videos just about me. So why aren't they just talking about their own faith? Why are they attacking me? It seems like they're obsessed with me. They should just convert to David Woodism, right? Uh, that's the reasoning there. Let, uh, let me throw in something here, David. Uh, yeah. There are entire chapters of the Quran, or at least large portions of the Quran, where Muhammad has taken uh, great uh, uh, liberties to uh, expostulate on, on Christianity. Almost the entirety of Surah 3, at least the first 80 verses, are a response to Christians. Mm -hmm. And that's just one chapter. In fact, one of the longest chapters of the Quran. Yeah, so uh, I, I mean, if you if you if you lay out the Quran, the Quran is constantly attacking Christianity, Judaism, paganism, um, any belief that uh, Jesus or anyone else is a son of God in any divine sense, Christian belief, Jewish belief, over and over again. So according to Fatima, since this is Allah, Allah should become a Christian or become a pagan because Allah spends so much time talking about these things. So. Uh, <laughs> That's what happens if you sort of make up the rules as you go along there, uh, Fatima. Uh, here's one for you, Anthony. How do we answer a Muslim when they ask why the Gospel of St. John is so dramatically different to the, store, to the synoptic Gospels and portray Jesus differently? Uh, thank you so much, David and Anthony. God bless your service. So, by the way, this is... You could easily spend half an hour on this topic. We do want to get to Kufar Watch because that uh, we want to. He has a lot of questions in there, and if we don't respond to every little bit, he's going to complain that we didn't respond to it. Um, but so, what would what would be the the nutshell response here? Yeah. So let me just take the main line of argumentation that people give as proof that the Gospel of John is decidedly different than what you find in the Synoptic Gospels. The primary argument is that in John's Gospel, you have Jesus going around 
using or uttering the divine name, the I am of the Old Testament, which you find in passages like Deuteronomy 32, 39, where the Lord says, see now that I am, and there's no other God besides me. In uh, Hebrew, that's Annie who, in the Greek text, it's ego and me. It's emphatic and absolute, a particular construction in Greek. Well, throughout the Gospel of John, you have Jesus uttering that phrase several times over as a way of uh, referring to himself. Just as an example, you have it in John 8, verse 24, 8, 28, and 8, 58. So three times in the space of one chapter, one debate with the religious leaders, Jesus utters the divine name, and the grand conclusion is that the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders want to stone Jesus. Uh, and significantly, it says that Jesus hid his face from them and uh, uh, passed out of their midst, which harkens back not only to the I am sayings of the Old Testament, but to the uh, the statement of God passing by Moses when he uttered his name. Well, uh, that seems to look very different than what you find in the Synoptic Gospels. Well, really, uh, this is just a result of uh, many of our translations don't render things as exactly or literally as they ought to. The fact is that you do find I am sayings in the Synoptic Gospels. For example, you have in Mark 14, when the high priest said to Jesus, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus replies categorically, I am. It's Again, it's emphatic and absolute in the Greek text. So there, it's unmistakably a reference back to the divine name. You also find it uh, in Mark 6.50 and Matthew 14.27. Both of those uh, passages are parallel, by the way, to one of the I am sayings in John's Gospel. Uh, it's the sea walking pericope where Jesus uh, is walking on the water to the boat where the disciples are, are struggling against the wind and the waves. And Jesus, uh, as they see him, they're afraid, and he says to them, don't be afraid, I am. And this is even uh, more significant because it's not just a, an I am statement, but it's almost an exact quotation of what you see in Isaiah 43, which is a prophecy about God delivering his people from the waters in the future. In that same context, God says, I am, and when you pass through the waters, you know, don't be afraid, I'll be with you. So uh, you do have Jesus speaking that way in the Synoptic Gospels. Now, we can grant that you don't find it as often in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, and here I would simply point out that one, one big difference between John's Gospel and the Synoptics is that the Synoptics are focusing on Christ's Galilean ministry and then they deal with the last period of Christ's life uh, in Jerusalem as he's uh, preparing to be crucified. John's Gospel, on the other hand, focuses on the, the festal occasions when Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. And so you have Jesus now in the heart of Israel, uh, in the midst of the religious leaders and, and so forth. And so you have a distinctively different audience and setting. And so uh, you know, to say that there's a difference between these two things isn't really much of an argument. Uh, because you know they're, they're entirely different settings, and when people are in different settings, different occasions, th there are different uh, uh, points that would be brought out, and so forth. That's true in any uh, uh, situation in life. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, basically, the idea is, as far as presenting a different Jesus, um, you can go to any one of the Gospels. Jesus is the divine Son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. Um, so th that Jesus is the same. Uh, where wh whichever gospel you go to, and I, w I would just add for because there, there's one objection that um, the theology, the theology of the Gospel of John, is um, so much more well developed than it might be elsewhere. But uh, the letters of Paul, the letters of Paul are are very early, and you see a, a theology every bit as developed as you find in the Gospel of John. So we know that the well developed theology does go back. To the earliest stages of Christianity, so uh, you're dealing with the same Jesus. You're dealing, but you're dealing with writers who are focusing on different things. That would be the uh, the short response there. All right, um, so we'll look at one more quick one, and this is I'll just read the source here. Um, but Dennis says I heard that there is a story in the Quran where monkeys were stoning a female monkey that committed adultery. And a man saw that and started to stone the monkey as well. Is that true, David? Well, it's not true that that comes from the Quran. That actually comes from the Hadith. That comes from uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. And just so you know, just because you wanted it, I'm going to go ahead and uh, read it for you. I went ahead and took a, took a screenshot of it here for you. So this is Sahih al-Bukhari, 3849, narrated Amr bin Maimun. 
During the pre-Islamic period of ignorance, I saw a she-monkey surrounded by a number of monkeys. They were all stoning it because it had committed illegal sexual intercourse. I, too, stoned it along with them. Now, there are a number of problems here. Um, one, this, this ends up as part of the collection that is Islam's most trustworthy material. So this is uh, a companion of Muhammad referring to the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. So this is before they received the knowledge of Islam. And the point of the Hadith is to show that Allah's commands about things like uh, stoning adulterers and adulteresses and so on is actually it's just part of the, the course of nature and that even animals would do the same thing. So to present this position, um, he says there was a, a, a she monkey, so a female monkey, surrounded by a number of monkeys, and they were stoning it because it had committed adultery. And then he joins in the stoning. Hey, the monkeys are stoning this female monkey. Let me join in too. Why? Well, it, everyone has the same goal, goal, right? Man, monkey, it's all part of nature. They're stoning the, the adulteress here. Now, first of all, absolute nonsense, right? Monkeys don't stone female monkeys. But two, imagine if you actually walked upon this one day. You see a bunch of monkeys. Suppose you're at, you know, you're at the Bronx Zoo. You're near the monkey cage. And you see, a, you see a bunch of monkeys surrounding another monkey, and they're pelting this monkey with rocks. How in the name of common sense would you know why they're pelting this monkey with rocks? How would you know that it's for committing adultery? And let alone jumping inside and joining in with them. Well, if these monkeys are stoning this female monkey, then by golly, as a devout Muslim, I need to join in. And, uh, and by the way, notice, he says this is the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. So monkeys were carrying out the penalty for adultery, and this guy wanted to carry out the penalty for adultery as well on this monkey. And again, this ends up, this, this, pa this passage, which is absolute, utter, total nonsense, ends up as part of the most reliable collection of stories that Muslims are supposed to take seriously in, in, developing, uh, in developing their understanding of Islam. Now, outside of the Quran, this is this is where you go, Sahih al-Bukhari. All right, so hope that helps. Now we want to go to our good friend, Kufar Watch. So, uh, Kufar Watch, let me go ahead and read this entire comment. So, Kufar Watch uh, posted a couple of comments. We responded to a couple of them. He still didn't seem to get it, but we'll go ahead and read his entire comment here. And uh, we'll respond and see what he thinks. So Kufar Watch says, Christians could not answer my questions in the chat to this video. That's odd. Everyone else thought we answered them. But we'll go ahead and do it again. I asked the men in the video if they believe Jesus created the world. And the one on the right said yes. And then I asked them if they believe that the creation can kill the creator and whether or not believing that was blasphemy. And they said that only the man part of their God died. So that means that it was a man and not a God. Because how do they know when he shifted into divinity and shifted off? Or are they not seeing that their doctrine is a blasphemy? And some of them said that their God wanted to be sacrificed. And so I asked them if their God allows himself to be murdered. Meaning, was your religion founded on your God? allowing himself to be murdered. So that is, a, that is a whole lot of questions here. And just to for a little outline, we're going to go ahead and respond to this. I have a couple uh, more questions here that we can respond to. But we're going to spend several minutes going through this point by point. And after that, we'll probably, we'll probably interact with uh, the chat for a little while and then uh, decide whether we want to go on to more questions there or just stick with uh, responding in the chat room. I did want to recognize very quickly, uh, Reserved 100 put uh, $49.99 in the Super Chat. So thank you for that. Reserved says, thanks for bringing all this to the light. Greatly appreciated. Well, just so you know, we haven't, we haven't even gotten started bringing stuff to the light here because there is so much, there is so much, so much out there. Um, so much deception out there. So many misrepresentations. Uh, so many Muslim sources to share, so many responses to so many bad arguments that Muslim apologists give that uh, we can be unpacking a lot of things for a while. But notice in, in this response from Kufar Watch, this is a perfect opportunity because how many, how many 
uh, mistakes and misunderstandings are contained in this one comment. So Anthony, we'll go ahead and, uh, and go through this. He said, I asked the men in the video if they believe that Jesus created the world. Just to be clear, we believe that Jesus created the world, right? Hey, one second, Anthony. You're muted somehow. Did you okay, so? be okay. Good uh, do that again. So, uh, so he asked this question the other day, and uh -huh. we clearly answered it by pointing to several texts. First, John 1, verses 1 through 3, which says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. By him all things were made. Mm -hmm. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The same statement is made in, in verse 10 when it says he was in the world, and even though the world was made through him, uh, the world did not recognize him. Uh, so uh, twice just in the first opening verses of John's Gospel, he says that Jesus created everything. Everything came into being through him. The and same so, thing is seen, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, the same thing is seen in Colossians 1.15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. You want me to continue with the, the passages that teach this? Or did um, you want to? I'm a, I'm a, uh, you probably want to hit Hebrews 1, right? Yeah, so. Okay, Hebrews go ahead and hit 1. Hebrews 1, and then we'll, then we'll move on. Okay, so Hebrews 1 says, God, after he spoke to the fathers and in, in the prophets through many portions and in various ways in these last days has spoken to us through his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the world and he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature so there's just three passages and we could cite others that clearly state that Jesus is God so this is all over the New Testament multiple writers multiple witnesses and everyone is agreeing that Jesus is the creator of the world. And so when Muslims say, oh, you know, Christianity was, was corrupted later on, we know that the doctrine that Jesus created the world goes back to first century Christianity. Is that correct? Absolutely. All right. So, yes, we believe that Jesus is the creator. Why? Because that's what Scripture reveals, and that's what Jesus has revealed about himself, and that's what... Uh, the authoritative apostles declare. So, obviously, as, as a Muslim, you don't want to believe that, but as we pointed out previously, if you reject that, then you're telling us to reject the gospel. But Allah tells us to judge by the gospel. Allah says we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the gospel, which means you have to say, oh, the gospel's been corrupted, but Allah doesn't say that. Allah affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the gospel in the possession of Christians and we know what the gospel in the possession of Christians was in the seventh century it's the gospel we have today so if you're telling us to reject the gospel you're telling us to reject Allah and to reject Islam that's a problem you have so what you're telling us Kufar watch is that we have to reject Islam so just keep that in mind all right so we were asked if we believe Jesus created the world the one on the right said yes and then I asked them if they believe that the creation can kill the creator and whether or not believing that was blasphemy. And they said, well, I guess we, you should answer that again for people who weren't watching yesterday. And then we're going to have to take a look at the misrepresentation here because he clearly didn't understand uh, what we said. So do we believe that the creation can kill the creator? And is that blasphemy? Okay, so first of all... Uh we would say that, no, the, the creation can't kill the creator. God, qua God, God as God, can't die. God is the source of all life, uh, uh, and everything depends upon him. Were God to cease uh, to exist, everything else would perish. Scripture tells us that if God were to withdraw his spirit and his breath, then all mankind would perish together in the book of Job. So, no, we would say God, uh, the creator, cannot be killed. However, the, the relevant question should be, can God become incarnate? And the Christian answer is that God can, and that God did. And the further question after that would be, if God becomes incarnate, is it possible for him to lay down uh, his human life as a sacrifice of atonement? And we would say absolutely, the entire Christian faith depends upon it. Uh, the very purpose of the incarnation was so that Jesus could lay down his life as a sacrifice for sinners. And so in the same books that we've already appealed to, showing that Christ is the creator, that Christ is God, 
we also read that Christ became flesh. He became incarnate. In John 1, verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I should add, not only would we say that Christ as God couldn't be killed, but even in terms of his incarnate uh, life, uh, nobody could take his life from him. He's a divine person with a truly human nature, uh, but it would still have to be something that he willingly uh, gives up if you know, for somebody to kill him. And Jesus himself indicates that at least two times in John's Gospel. Again, the same Gospel that says Christ created everything. In John chapter 2, Jesus said to the Jews, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then it goes on to say that he was referring to the temple of his body. So Jesus in John's Gospel says that uh, if, if they kill him, then he will raise up his own body from the dead, which shows that he is the one ultimately who has the power of life and death. The same thing is seen again in John chapter 10 when Jesus said, uh, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one can take it from me. I lay it down of my own initiative. I have the authority or power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. So Jesus clearly states that nobody has the power to kill him, and he has the power to raise himself from the dead, even after he allows uh, uh, them to take his uh, human life. All right, now, there is a, a, even though I think you've stated it clearly, uh, there is a tendency um, to misunderstand the point here. So we're saying that Jesus has a dual nature, and we're saying that because Jesus took on a human nature, because the Word became flesh, that when we say that Jesus died, we're only saying that his human nature died. It's easy to misunderstand that because when we want to emphasize that the divine nature doesn't somehow cease to exist or something like that we refer to the human nature as dying but when when kufar watch says and they said that only the man part of their god died so that means that it was a man and not a god is that what we're claiming that there are somehow two christs and there and one is divine and the other is human and that the human christ died but not the divine christ is that what we're claiming no, that, that actually has a name. It's, it refers to an ancient heresy called Nestorianism, the idea that Christ uh, has uh, almost two personalities so that one could be experiencing one thing, another could be experiencing another. Well, while we would say that it was by virtue of his humanity that Christ was able to die, Christ is only one person. He's a divine person who has both a divine and human nature. So while Jesus died in his human nature, it was a divine person who is experiencing death through that human nature. And so the, the death of Christ was uh, efficacious for the sins of, of all who put their trust in him, precisely because it wasn't merely a, uh, a man, a human being, who was dying, but a divine person who was experiencing death uh, th uh, through the incarnate uh, nature that he took upon himself. Uh, and, and just as one indication of that, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, Paul says that it was the Lord of glory who was crucified. So he's there clearly using a divine title, but he's ascribing to uh, him the uh, experience of death. So it was an experience uh, of an, a divine person and not merely uh, or uh, of a separate human person. So um, the claim here that, so that means that it was a man and not a God, we would say that, the God man died, right? Yes. Okay. Because, so he goes on, because how do they know when he shifted into divinity and shifted off? Or are they not seeing that their doctrine is a blasphemy? So basically, we're saying Jesus could shift his, turn his divinity on or turn it off like a switch. Is that what we're claiming here? No, that's, that's not the Christian claim. Christ uh, has two complete natures, deity and humanity, uh, and both natures remain what they are, though. The human nature never becomes the divine nature. The divine nature never becomes the human nature. So the divine nature never hungers, never thirsts, never tires, never is ignorant. The human nature uh, does hunger, thirst, get tired, weary, grow, and, and so forth. Uh, these things aren't being switched on and off, uh, but Jesus is simultaneously uh, you know, both. He, he is divine and human. So uh, the, the light switch analogy simply isn't true to the Bible. So 
the Word became flesh. The Word, who is God, became flesh. And because the Word became flesh, because God became flesh, God can then experience death even though God in his divine nature does not cease to exist or something like that, but experiences death through becoming flesh. Yes. And that's about as clear as we can make it to our Muslim friends without giving an example in Islam, but we'll do that in a moment. But there's a little, little bit to finish this here uh, because we want to be thorough. He goes on to say, and some of them said that their God wanted to be sacrificed. So, is, uh, would, would, would we say that? Y yes. Okay. And so I asked them if their God allows himself to be murdered, meaning was your religion founded on your God allowing himself to be murdered? How would you respond to that? Yes, that's exactly what Jesus said he came into the world to do. Jesus said, uh, no man has the authority to take my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. So this is something that Jesus willingly undertook. Uh, you also have Jesus saying in Mark 10, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Everyone who's familiar with the Old Testament background for that title, the Son of Man in Daniel 7, knows that it's referring to a divine figure who appears as a human being. And so Jesus says that he came into the world precisely to serve men by laying down his life as a ransom for sinners. So that's, that's the clear teaching of the New Testament. Uh, in fact, even to ask that question shows that he hasn't even really taken much time to try and understand what mm -hmm. Christianity is all about. And we could, we could uh, point out that it, when we're saying that Jesus came into the world uh, to die, to be murdered, to be killed at the hands of sinners, we're not just saying that it was for the fun of it or that he just wanted to be murdered. If you have a God who's perfect in justice, right? If his justice is perfect, all sin must be punished. If you let some sin slide, justice isn't perfect. But our God is also perfect in love and mercy. And so if God is perfect in love and mercy, he wants to forgive, he wants to pardon sin. And so the presence of sinners poses a problem for the divine attributes. Uh, justice demands that our sins be punished, and love and mercy would call, uh, call for forgiveness. And so what is a perfect God going to do? Well, um, God's justice and mercy meet at the cross, and what happens is all sin has been punished. At the end of time in Christianity, all sin has been been punished. Every sin that's ever been committed. People either pay for it themselves or Jesus paid for it at the cross. But God's perfect justice has been maintained. All sin has been punished. And yet, God did absolutely everything required for the forgiveness of those whose sins are forgiven. So God's love and mercy are perfect. His justice is perfect. Notice how different this is from Islam, where the solution to this problem is to diminish and degrade God's attributes. God's justice isn't perfect, according to Islam. Allah can just let all kinds of sin slide. So his justice isn't perfect, nor is his love perfect. Allah just doesn't love unbelievers. Um, Allah loves you if you first loved him. Exactly the sort of love that Jesus condemns in Matthew chapter 5. So... Uh, the reason Muslims have so much difficulty understanding this, uh, this concept is that they have a degraded view of God, right? If you, do, if you don't believe God is all that loving, why would he enter creation to, punish, you know, to accept punishment for your sins? Why would he do that? Allah doesn't love you that much. doesn't make any sense, right? Right, it doesn't, because Allah doesn't, lo doesn't love people that much. Um, and if God can just let sin slide and doesn't really care all that much, he's not, he's not that upset about sins, why would he need to do something so drastic? It's not like, you know, he could just let him slide. Well, yeah, if you have a God who's defective in justice. So uh, Christians, because we believe in a perfect God with perfect attributes, um, we see how that God achieved our salvation for us. Um, so uh, I did want to give one example, and then uh, Anthony could also add a problem if he sees one. But uh, because Muslims have such a difficult time with this, um, something that's actually quite helpful is showing them what happens if we take their objections seriously. 
So notice the objection here is that uh, God, God either cannot or would not enter into creation. God, would, the word would not become flesh. God would not become flesh, either because God just doesn't care that much or God can't, something like that. And so Muslims have a huge problem understanding how something that's divine can become something physical which is, it should be shocking to Christians. And Christians, if you want to learn something out there about how to respond to Muslims, learn, learn a little bit about Islamic theology because it can help you help them to understand their own theology. And by understanding their own theology, uh, it'll force them to drop certain objections against Christian theology. So here's an example. Um, this is a Quran, right? So matter of fact, this is, this, is, this is the complete Arabic, but it also has the English translation and commentary. So let me go and fix that problem. And oh, we have an Arabic-only Quran here. So in the Arabic-only Quran, my Muslim friends, would you say that the Quran is eternal or that it has a beginning? Is the Quran eternal? Is it Allah's eternal word? Or does the Quran have a beginning? It had a beginning at some point in time. Go ahead and answer if anyone wants to answer in the comment section here. Tell me whether the Quran, whether your Quran is eternal or whether it has a beginning. Want to see, uh, want to see some answers? Anyone want to answer? You want me to answer for you? All right, I don't see an answer here. Let me go ahead and answer for you. According to Islamic theology, the Quran is eternal. In fact, uh, <laughs> if you say that the Quran has a beginning, that Allah's word has a beginning, then you would be, be regarded as a heretic, and there are times in, in Islamic history where they would kill you for saying that the Quran has a beginning. Oh, uh, Hassan here says, eternal, because the Bible and Torah has the same content. Lol, can't tell whether he's uh, <laughs> he's joking or not. Um, so, uh, yes, according to Islamic theology, the Quran is Allah's eternal word. It has no beginning. It can't be corrupted. It can't be altered. It has no end. Now, think about this. The Quran is Allah's eternal word. So much so that uh, at various points in Islamic history, if you said the Quran had a beginning, that's, that's a death penalty. They're going to kill you over it. So the Quran is eternal. But there's just one problem here. Um, all the Qurans I have, they were published. They were published at a certain time. Oh, this one comes from Al-Azhar, actually. So that's very interesting. Now, has Al-Azhar always existed? Is Al-Azhar... University? Eternal? No. <laughs> so, this is put out by Al-Azhar. This means it comes sometime after Al-Azhar, right? So, I is this Quran eternal? No, it's not. This Quran has a beginning, right? D isn't that true, Muslims? D doesn't the Quran have, doesn't this Quran have a beginning? It does. Uh, is this Quran incorruptible? No. No, it could be corrupted right now. I could start ripping pages out of it. I could burn it right now, right? And then the Quran, this, this Quran could be destroyed. Why? Because it's a physical Quran made of paper and glue and ink, right? I'm, I'm just stating what, what's what the obvious here, right? This is no, there's nothing confusing here. Um, so, will this Quran have an ending? Yes, even if I take very good care of it, because it's made of paper and glue and ink, it will not last forever. There are certain places in the world that are very dry, places out in the desert, where paper will just last forever. Most places, it's not going to last forever. It will eventually rot, uh, will eventually get eaten by bookworms, um, it will eventually fall apart. Uh, this Quran is not going to last forever. So, it, the Quran here has a beginning, it is corruptible, it can fall apart, it won't last forever. But now I'm confused, because you told me that the Quran is Allah's eternal word with no beginning, and it can't be corrupted, and cannot be destroyed. So, what are you saying here? Because you're telling me two very different things. And it's almost like when Christians say that Jesus is God, and as such, uh, has no beginning, has no end, but also was a, few, a physical human being who was born and who died on the cross. And you're, you're remarkably confused by those statements. Why? Because you ignore the part where the Word became flesh. 
And it, and when we tell you that the Word became flesh, you don't understand. You say, ah, that makes no sense. That makes absolutely no sense. Okay, so it makes no sense for something that's uh, divine and immaterial to enter creation as something physical, right? That doesn't make sense. So you're telling us that it makes absolutely no sense for something that is eternal, like Allah's eternal Word, to enter our world as a physical book. That's what you're telling us, right? That that is completely illogical. And any ideology that includes something divine and eternal entering creation as something physical, any ideology that includes something like that is ridiculous, illogical, irrational, and false. That's what you're telling us, right? Because if you're telling us that, then you're telling us that Islam is false, that Muhammad was a false prophet, that Allah is a false god, that the Quran is a false book. That's what you're telling us if you make that claim. I'm assuming that you don't want to make that claim. That you want to say, oh, well, if that's what Islam teaches, then yes, I can see how something that is eternal and incorruptible can enter creation and take on a physical form. And because it has taken on a physical nature, yes, the physical nature would allow what is eternal to now experience creation, right? Because the Quran is the, this Quran is created. It has a beginning. So this Quran was created. This Quran can be corrupted. This Quran can be ripped to shreds. But it's only because the eternal Quran took on this physical nature that these things are possible, right? And yet you wouldn't say, if this Quran were destroyed, that the eternal nature of the Quran was somehow destroyed. In other words, if I ripped out Surah 1, you wouldn't say that Surah 1 was ripped out of the eternal Quran, assuming it's in the eternal Quran, Muslims have had differences of opinion going back to the time of Muhammad himself on whether Surat al-Fatiha is actually supposed to be in the Quran. So, you Muslims, now you're stuck, right? Now you're stuck because if you stick with the same objection that Muslims like Kufar watch bring forward, you now have to reject Islam. You don't want to reject Islam, so you have to say, of course something that's eternal can enter creation as something physical. And because it has taken on a physical nature, is therefore capable of being destroyed, even though this wouldn't ultimately destroy the eternal word of Allah. You have to say things like that. And if so, why? Why don't you understand when we say that the word became flesh and dwelt among us? And because the word became flesh, the word could then be born be beaten, eat, drink, sleep, and die. You can't say that that is illogical or irrational without undermining your own theology of your own book. So keep that in mind. Now, there are other problems we could point out here, Anthony. Um, we want to get to some people in the chat, but you might want to add a point here since I've been talking for a long time. Uh, yeah, I'll just make the point quickly then so we can get to others. Uh, first, I just want to point out that there are three verses in the Quran, Surah 3, 185, Surah 2135, and Surah 2957, which make what in logic is referred to as a universal affirmative statement. And the statement is, every soul shall taste death. Every soul shall taste death. There's no exceptions to that uh, rule. Wait, so wait, so, so, there's, so there's a rule, in the, just to be clear here, there's a rule in the Quran that says every soul, every last one, no exceptions, will taste death. Yes. Okay. Uh, three okay. statements, three okay. times in the Quran. So uh, apparently Allah really wants to get this point across. Uh, the reason that I bring this up in relation to this is because there's another statement in the Quran, most Muslims probably aren't aware of it, that actually says that Allah has a soul. In Surah uh, 5, 116, we're told that Allah is supposedly going to ask Jesus, son of Mary, did you tell men to consider you and your mother as their gods besides Allah. And then, here's the reply that Allah says Jesus is going to make in the Quran. Glory be to you, how could I say what I have no right to say? Had I ever said it, you would have certainly known about it. You know what is in my soul, but I do not know what is in yours. Wait, so wait, 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 you're what? My soul. So, so Jesus allegedly is going to say that Allah knows what's in his soul, but Isa or Jesus doesn't know what's in Allah's soul. Wait, now, Allah, wait, Allah has a soul? According to this passage, he does. And in fact, this translation isn't even as exact as it should be. 
it has Jesus saying, you know what's in my soul, I don't know what's in yours, but really it repeats the word for soul. It so says, in, you don't so, know what's so, in my so soul. In the, Arabic, in the Arabic, in the perfect Quran, Allah's perfect eternal word, it refers to Allah's soul. Yes. Okay. Yes. So when we put these two things together in the form of a syllogism, every soul shall taste death, Allah has a soul or is a soul, therefore the conclusion must be Allah will taste death. And so in response to uh, Kufar, uh, King or whatever his name is, uh, he has to grant that if the Quran is consistent, if it's logically consistent, then Allah has to be able to do the very thing that he's objecting to Jesus doing, even though Allah, according to the Quran, never became incarnate, or else Allah's hiding something from us. Uh, maybe the maybe Allah knows something that uh, he hasn't told Kufar King about his nature. Perhaps Allah actually is an embodied being. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, and I, you, I don't you, want to go down this. You, you, you have plenty of evidence for that, right? <laughs> yeah, the the word nafs for soul in the Quran actually means a a an embodied spirit. So the very fact that it's used for Allah suggests that Allah has a human-like anatomy. And so uh, in, in your videos and on some issues that we'll certainly be touching on in uh, future episodes here, Allah has a physical body, and so Allah's soul would be contained in a physical body. And because the Quran says that every soul will die, that Allah's soul will die. Right. Yep. Okay, and that's what that's what hap that's what happens if we uh, if we start looking at the Muslim sources. And for Muslims who want to reject that, you should go ahead and tell your God not to say things like "Every soul shall die" when the same book says that He has a soul. Right. You you should uh, <laughs> you should ask your God to be a bit more clear in His perfectly clear word. Um, all right. So we good on that. Let me go ahead and uh, grab a comment from <laughs> from the chat here. This is from uh, CJH. It says, so, what do you guys think about Alexander the Great starting the Catholic Church 300 years before Christ? I should have saved that. I should have saved that because we, uh, we need to play the video clip. But, uh, Anthony, what is, what, what is this about? Yeah, I, it's a reference to a statement made by Yusuf Estes in uh, one of the lectures that he gave. He was questioned by, I, I think it was a, a young Catholic lady, and she uh, she asked a question. I think it was about Jesus. It was many many uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago that I first saw this. So I'm not sure her exact question. But in his reply, Yusuf Estes uh, said that uh, uh, Alexander the Great went west and uh, founded the Catholic Church 300 years before Jesus. So uh, apparently one of the commenters has also seen that video. Uh, Wait, so it, by the way, is that two things? One, um, isn't Yusuf Estes one of the most popular sought after apologists in the Muslim world? He's one of those guys that uh, spends so much time talking about Christianity, he should become a Christian. Yeah, I mean, if he spends that much time talking about Christianity, everyone knows he should convert to it like <laughs> Allah. <laughs> For those of you who just tuned in and don't know what we're talking about, go back and uh, check out a comment by Fatima earlier, um, who complains that we spend too much time talking about Islam, and that if we anyone who spends so much time talking about Islam should go ahead and convert. Um, but so, Yusuf Estes is one of the most popular Muslim apologists out there, and yet he, well, he 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 he's his sort of claim to fame is that he's a, a former Christian. Um, and and he, he does something that, that's very, very similar to something I see from lots of other um, converts from Christianity to Islam. They make the claim that they were a, a, they were a former Christian minister, right? And they specifically say minister because it can be technically correct, right? If you're a Christian, then you are technically a minister of the gospel. It just means servant, servant of the gospel, right? But they know that when people hear minister, they're going to think pastor or priest or something like that, right? A church leader. So they constantly talk about themselves as former ministers of Christianity, uh, which is basically a, you could apply to any Christian. Um, and they specifically use that term to insist that 
because they know that people will interpret that as they were church leaders. And I'm saying this because almost every Muslim who tells me about Yusuf Estes tells me, and see, he was a pastor or he was a priest before he converted. And what happens when we look at comments like this, right? Um, Anthony, wouldn't you expect anyone who had any sort of education in Christianity, and I mean even if he went to Sunday school, I don't mean someone who went to seminary and uh, earned degrees in his study of Christianity. I'm talking anyone who attended Sunday school regularly when he was a kid. Wouldn't you expect him to know that the Catholic Church wasn't started by Alexander the Great in Rome three centuries before Christ? Wouldn't you expect him to know at least that? Yeah, that that uh, that got that have to be up there in the top five. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't in, even. <laughs> in 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 other so there there are kind of two two important points I, I would say here one. Um, I've never heard of a Christian so completely ill-informed, so ridiculously ill-informed, that he would think that the Catholic Church was started by Alexander the Great in Rome three centuries before Christ. Never heard, never come across one. So that's one point, right? I've never heard of a Christian who is as ignorant of Christianity as Yusuf Estes. So that's one point, right? So that should tell you, oh, is it a shocker that a Christian with this level of ignorance was convinced of the truth of Islam by a Muslim who went in and took advantage of that complete, utter, total ignorance? That's one thing. But there's something else here. Namely, why is it that the more ignorant you are of basic Christianity, the more popular you can become as a Muslim apologist? Right? There are, there are Muslims like Shabir Ali who study a lot of uh, scholarship. They study the Bible. They study Christian uh, scholars. They study non-Christian scholars, atheist scholars. But they, 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 they study a lot of New Testament scholarship. That's people like Shabir Ali. But he just never... Pe people like that who... We, again, we, we, don't, we don't agree with Shabir's arguments. We, we find Shabir's arguments um, to be extremely flawed. But we can at least appreciate that he actually tries to, <laughs> tries to interact, tries to study. People like Yusuf Estes are the absolute most ignorant people you could ever imagine. And Yusuf Estes is far more popular than Shabir Ali. Right? It seems like the more ignorant you are, the more completely clueless you are, the more you misrepresent and distort Christianity based on your complete ignorance, the more popular you become among Muslims. So why do you think that is, Anthony, by the way? I, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I'm just, I, I find it interesting. Well, I, I think one, one question would be, where are these people popular? Obviously, they, they get an audience on YouTube, but when I look at some of these things, like when you look at Zachar Nike, obviously he's, he's over in countries where, uh, you know, maybe maybe you can say they just don't have access to some of these, but I, I, don't, I don't even think there that there's anybody really run, running around wondering whether or not Alexander the Great started uh, the Christian Church or the Catholic Church or what have you, um, but I mean I just, I I guess I'm just fishing here because I can't really imagine a, a very good scenario where where he's becoming you know, the level of ignorance. But uh, the best I can come up with is maybe maybe the audience. Uh, actually, uh, one thing that you see it's the same technique where you have with Zach or Nike is is people that ask questions and then get ridiculous answers don't really get an opportunity to offer a rejoinder, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it very well could have been that the, the young lady who asked the question had a quick and ready response for him and would have made him look ridiculous, uh, but that gets cut off because he doesn't allow her to continue her line of questioning. And so uh, I, I think a problem would be here. I mean, if there were a Christian apologist a pop who, who became one of the most popular Christian apologists in the world, and was so clueless, so utterly clueless about Islam that he started saying things about Islam that are on par with the things that Yusuf Estes says about Christianity, right? Like if, if he were to say, you know, Islam started three centuries before the time of Muhammad when such and such leader went to such and such city and 
other Christians would call him out. Other Christians would come forward and say, guy, you need to sit down and shut up because you're, make, you're embarrassing us with the idiotic statements you're making. You're, you're embarrassing us. But for some reason, when Yusuf Estes makes these ridiculous claims, um, one, the vast majority of Muslims just nod their heads, and those who know that it's utter nonsense, namely anyone who knows anything about Christianity, who would therefore know more than Yusuf Estes, uh, just mostly keeps quiet. So this is very interesting. Anyway, we are out of time. It's 9 o'clock. We know we had uh, plenty more in the chat. Uh, maybe some other time this week we'll, we'll do what we did yesterday and uh, just focus on the chat. Just focus on, on interacting with the chat as we go. Um, we also want to start trying to play some video clips here to expand on our understanding of the software. But we will be back, Lord willing, tomorrow night. Same time, same channel for more Answering Islam Live. So, uh, Anthony, the time has to uh, fade out here, so contemplative stare.